Dear respected Thai, dear beloved Sangha, dear beloved community here in Plum Village, uh, we feel connected uh, very much with you in India. I'm looking at the camera. I know India is in that lens. And uh, I, uh, yeah, feel very blessed to be able to make uh, this connection with you all, uh, with us all. I'd like to just invite our brother uh, Daobi, uh, our brother from Indonesia, to invite three sounds of the bell. Yeah, just for us all to uh, come back to our breathing, come back to this present moment, and feel ourselves um, present, just like with the tea, and maybe listen to uh, the sound of the Buddha's voice calling us back to our true home. So yeah, this talk uh, is part of this wonderful way to be together and it's in the spirit of togetherness, a practice session together as a Sangha, as a community. Um, and it's not, I don't feel like uh, um, I'm a teacher teaching to, uh, but rather a member of the Sangha and yeah, in this time, I feel in many ways India is teaching us. So, and uh, when I listen to all of the sharings uh, from the tea meditation, the haikus, and uh, Shantam's uh, beautiful uh, way to, to convey what is happening with yeah, it really made me feel like uh, your Sangha in India has so much to, to offer and to be, to be able to uh, teach us the way to deal with in difficult times, to touch joy and cherish the, the life we have, to make use of the, the beautiful uh, moments that we can have the beauty around us. Mm. Today is also, as we know, the, the celebration of the Buddha's birthday and also enlightenment. And so this day is also one of celebration as well as touching um, the aspects of how we take care of our suffering 
in these difficult times. When uh, I just want to link a little bit when uh, Shantam talked about the, the wonderful manifestation of actions uh, in India, the, the amazing work that is uh, happening through different communities like the Sikh community, the Gurdwaras. Uh, there is a link to the UK uh, also because I'm quite proud of our Sikh community there because they also stepped up a lot um, providing meals for those that were in isolated old people in England. Uh, they're coming from a the one that I'm, I heard the report of was from the place of Gravesend, which is south of London. And um, yeah, there was a moment where there was a lockdown. Uh, I think it was a sudden overnight ban on England being able to go to France. So there was a sort of traffic jam of 800 truck drivers all at Dover about to go over and they were stuck kind of completely locked into yeah just being in their trucks and this community because it had already been active in in offering meals uh, was able to mobilize and within a day offer 800 me hot meals and i think they were they offered a choice that could be a curry or another kind of more english uh, meal <laughs> I can't remember what, what the choice was, but I think both options were vegan, if maybe vegetarian. So I was very touched when I read this, and as I say, felt proud of our Sikh community in the UK, and I think the world has been inspired uh, by their actions in India, and there are, of course, so many other people, communities, the hospital, um, staff, they're a, they're a kind of community, uh, between the doctors and nurses and all acting so courageously, you could say helping strangers, and yet they risk their life and many are, are catching uh, to become sick, and etc. So we have this gratitude. We know also that the situation is, is overwhelming. And um, as much as people want to, to help, they're also dealing with their own uh, personal situations. I know of um, other yeah, people that are helping in schools to uh, help children and who's also uh, on a daily basis many many families losing maybe they're losing their mother or father and teachers stepping up to to offer support and comfort to their students. So in so many areas, uh, people are needing to be there for each other. So, yeah, such, uh, such gratitude and, and um, a feeling of deep um, respect and appreciation for those people. Back to the Buddha's birthday. <laughs> uh, back to uh, the Buddha's enlightenment. When it, when the Buddha set out on his path, it was it was to find uh, find out how can I take care of suffering. He recognized suffering in himself all around, and um, he under the Bodhi tree. Uh, found an answer to take care of suffering and discovered something quite remarkable that there is also well-being <laughs> that there is also a need for us to acknowledge our suffering and through that acknowledgement there is a path to well-being so we don't ignore our suffering we recognize we name it we say yes I am suffering. And that already is the beginning of the path that can liberate us. 
aware of that um, when we are invited, for instance, in a guided meditation, as we had today, to touch uh, joy, to touch our, the joy of sitting and breathing, we realize that uh, joy, that feeling of joy that comes from the practice is not in conflict with our suffering. It's not uh, um, somehow the opposite of. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more like the, the mud and the lotus engraved on your teacup, Shantam. Uh, it's a recognition that the two can go together and there is not a contradiction. That is the way of life. Just as in life there is birth and death, and there is suffering and there is happiness, and it's our way of relating to that reality that uh, we have more or less suffering. The way in which we learn to handle our suffering uh, is so important. Yeah. And the Buddha had many uh, ways he's, he's transmitted to us that have been kept, kept alive for us and renewed. But essentially the human condition somewhat remains the same. You know, you feel like there was, just as there was pandemics in the Buddha's time, there was all of the emotions that people had to deal with, the grief. There is the beautiful story in the Buddha's time of uh, a lady who went uh, to the Buddha with anguish for losing her baby and the Buddha advised her to get a mustard seed, I think it was, from ev any house, just one house where the... the uh, no, she was invited to get a mustard seed from each house, but at each house she had to make sure that that house there was nobody had died. And she thought that this would be an easy task. So she went to the village and one by one uh, they all were very happy to offer her uh, a seed to take. And then she just double checked. But has anybody died in this household? Oh yes, you know, somebody died. Uh, our, f our father died uh, last year. And she said, oh, well, I can't take the seed from here. And one by one, she went round the house, houses and discovered uh, that uh, she couldn't find the house where there had not been a death. And being an intelligent woman, she got the message and she was able to go back to the Buddha and even she was in her grief having lost her baby and uh, she took refuge in the Buddha and understood the teaching that she was not alone in her grief and uh, rather than looking for the miracle of bringing her baby back to life she looked for uh, to the Buddha as a teacher to teach her how to take care of her suffering, her grief and to be there for other people so this story uh, is a reminder that we are not alone in our grief. I'm thinking in uh, the current situation in India that is never more obvious. Everybody is suffering. There is a kind of overwhelm with the amount and this is a suffering in itself, this feeling of overwhelm. I think even with um, the sense of an overwhelming suffering uh, we have to say, okay, I acknowledge I'm, I am overwhelmed by this suffering. If we've been able to establish a practice of coming back, taking refuge in the breath and finding our stability, we can maybe bring that to our overwhelmed feeling. Uh, if we have not been not practicing, it can be much harder to touch the peace uh, when we have strong emotions. So, embracing our emotions, just as Shantam shared, uh, the image Thai gives is like a mother holding her baby, her crying baby. And um, mindfulness 
is said to be the energy of the Buddha. The substance of the Buddha is this energy of mindfulness and it has this capacity to embrace what is there. The more we have cultivated our mindfulness energy, the more we have the capacity to embrace what is, what is there. So, when the Buddha um, had his time under the Bodhi tree and he uh, got enlightened, what did he get enlightened about? <laughs> I think, again, it's already been said earlier in this session, but one of the the key things that we hear about is this nature of interbeing. This sense that, uh, this discovery, if you like, that we are not separate selves, that we are interconnected, and that that is the nature of life. That is our nature, that is nature's nature, and we are part of nature. And with that, how can one discriminate? One of the things that really attracted me to, to Buddhism and, and the Buddha was this spirit of non-discrimination. And that is uh, uh, one of his, for me, a kind of a key quality of, of the Buddha's teaching as a, and the Buddha as a person, this, this quality of non-discrimination. And I think it comes from this deep insight, this enlightenment about interbeing. The Buddha said, is said to have said, uh, I wasn't there personally, but even I've been on the pilgrimage. Uh, but he's said to have said, I, dis I, I discovered an ancient path to an ancient city. It was like a, a rediscovery of something that was already there. Maybe he had to hack through the brambles and the bush to get to this ancient city. Uh, but for us, it's like the path is already been cleared. And the, the path, there's many signs on the path now for us to, to uh, be able to follow it quite easily. You would think. <laughs> but we often get caught in the, the finger pointing at the moon. We get caught in the signs. We, we enjoy looking at the map, but taking those steps, actually practicing, that's something we have to do for ourselves. Even it's uh, the baby steps. We, we need to, to do that for ourselves. We need to take those steps. And I think drinking a cup of tea is, a, is not too difficult. And it's a real start. You know, when I, it was so moving. If someone, uh, one of our, our friends in India, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, uh, can drink a cup of tea with her father in that hospital with mindfulness and cherish the life and the, the, the relationship there. We know that uh, this practice is meaningful. It's not just uh, something superficial. If we can bring the practice of drinking tea to that, that's, this is not a trivial practice. To be able to, to be there for our loved ones when they are suffering. That is something we, we really dearly wish to be able to do. But if we have too much suffering in us, uh, it's not so easy to do. We may not be able to, to be stable, to be free in that moment. We may be frightened by the situation because it's it touching our own fear of our own death. Of, our, of the potential for us to also get sick. So the Buddha invited uh, all of his uh, disciples to practice on a daily basis to acknowledge the truth that we do get sick. There's not an escape from that, that we do, we will die. 
and acknowledge the fear that comes with that, the very natural fear, the very kind of, you could say, healthy fear. Because it is the kind of fear that protects us, that helps us avoid in, uh, dangerous situations. And it says, I, I care about you living. You, I'm going to make you feel frightened so you, you, you don't die. But in these times, um, so the Buddha offered this practice so that his disciples would be familiar with this fear and be able to calm it and then look more deeply and see, see something else. When we, when we get a bit beyond the fear and we've taken care of the emotion, we have a chance to see something reflected, if you like, in the karma still water. And we can see like the, the um, Puri Nima, the full moon reflected in the lake that tells us that there is much, much more than just the fear. And there is something beyond that not even death touches. We heard that we can be in touch with people drinking tea beyond time and space. The normal constructs, ideas of how uh, things are. Yeah. When the teaching was given to an Anatha Pandika, uh, when he was about to pass away uh, and he was in a lot of pain with his sickness, he was invited to meditate on his gratitude and his beautiful life of service to the Sangha. Meditate on the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And then in, invite his body, which was deteriorating and in pain. But also see that he was much more than his body, so aware of my eyes, not caught in these two eyes, aware of my body, not caught by this body, meaning, yes, you have a body. Yes, uh, everything you uh, experience, is, is the, it is there, but you are much more than that. You're much more than your personality, even. Because you're connected at a very deep level to, to nature, to everything that is, including the whole cosmos. Tai, uh, in his insight, also talks about this nature of interbeing. He talks about the sacred forest, the power of the sacred forest, when he talks about the Sangha, how we are trees, uh, like we are, can liken ourselves to trees in a forest, being growing and offering shade to each other, offering uh, nutriments to each other, supporting each other in a forest. The classical uh, view of a forest is just individual trees competing for resources with each other. But it's been proven. There is a woman called Suzanne Simard who's just come out with a book. Uh, this could be the subject of a whole Dharma talk, uh, but how trees actually um, collaborate and they Absolutely, just as Tai expresses, he would like to see us as a, sang as a Sangha, it is very true that they support each other, sharing nutriments, sharing information, sharing wisdom. The mother tree, she describes, the, the, there are mother trees in forests which have been around many hundreds of years perhaps, and they have the wisdom and the experience of previous climates and they maybe connect themselves with many, many trees and offer them nutrients from the photosynthesis. And trees of different species supporting each other. 
in the spirit of non-discrimination. It's not uh, a competition, it's a collaboration, it's a community of trees. And that is why they survive so well, because they collaborate as a community. And the power of a Sangha is, is that also. Our collective energy is much more than the sum of just our individual practices. There is something we generate, something that happens when we come together as a community, as we're doing today. I would even, yeah, invite us to, to wherever we're se seated, to recognize uh, here I am, where we're in Plum Village and you may be in India or you may be in some other part of the world and just to find yourself uh, where you are and know that uh, just like in the forest we're actually all connected. We are physically connected right now by Mother Earth. We're all sitting on Mother Earth. We all have the full moon uh, above us. We might uh, also see that we are connected by the practice, by the aspiration to, to practice. By um, the energy of mindfulness, awareness, just bringing awareness, I am here, I am alive. And we, we see that, yes, uh, we are connected by love. This joy to be together, this natural instinct to be there for each other, to share life together in cooperation, in the spirit of interbeing, including sharing our suffering. Compassion is to suffer, to suffer with. Compassion. It's uh, something uh, that comes naturally to us when we're in our Buddha nature. And when we're caught in our smaller uh, sense of self and we are caught with a lot of emotions of fear and anxiety, we can maybe lose touch with that Buddha nature, that natural compassion. Yeah. And maybe we are isolated in a home on our own. We don't have the chance to be with with people physically. But if we can remind ourselves we have the our Buddha nature and we have our connection to people, to our mothers and fathers, to the spiritual ancestors, to those that are here and now alive, to this community, to the trees, to the rivers. It's all here and we can find uh, ourselves, even we may be on our own, we're not on our own in the way we thought. So we can let go of that thought that makes us suffer. Through the practice of mindfulness, concentration, we come to that insight that we are alive and we are not alone in our suffering, that we are not alone at all, that we have each other. We may feel hopeless, but when we connect like that, we start to see ways in which we support each other. Even to restore our sense of, of well-being, so many possibilities can open up when we restore our connection to our Buddha nature, to our comp natural compassion, our natural joy to be alive and gratitude. And this is possible. And it's wonderful to know that we do it together so that we generate a collective energy. And from that place we can do many things and we can serve and we can help. 
we can find ways to, to help. It may be with just uh, beginning with our family, but then we can extend and see how can we help in the, the, the nation, uh, local communities, etc. And one last thing about Buddha nature is that it's always there for us. It's our, all the work is that we make ourselves available to it, to when we've lost connection with it, we should know it's still there. It's not damaged even by our trauma. It's, it's there, undamaged, fully, like the sun behind the clouds. Yeah? So even the clouds are there, but we know. If we've practiced deeply, we have that experience, then even when the clouds are there, we remember that experience and we can have confidence, have faith that that is the case, even we're experiencing overwhelm. And we can be in touch with that peace. And Thai's calligraphy, if you want peace, if you really want peace, if you need peace, peace is with you immediately. But through the way of the practice, through really connecting, calming, and yeah, asking for compassion to be there and having that faith that that peace is available to you, you can touch that peace when you need it, when you really need it. And this is uh, borne out by people who find themselves in crisis situations. You don't have to be Buddhist to, to experience this. It's part of our heritage, part of, our, uh, part of the good news this Buddha nature or this love, God's love, you could call it, the self with a capital S if you want, <laughs> it is there for us, our, our true home. So let us, um, yeah, thank, give thanks that we can connect today. Let us um, also know that our practice really matters yeah, each in our individual situation, whatever we can do, however we can support each other in our local community, we, we need to know that that is so important. Don't give way to despair or hopelessness in that sense. <laughs>